Almost none of the experts thought the Chicago Bears would beat the San Francisco 49ers in week one, but here we are. It's Victory Monday, and the Bears sent the rest of the NFL a message with the identity that they established to start the season. You are Locked On Bears, your daily Chicago Bears podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Locked On Bears, and I'm your host, Lauren Cox. I'm here to bring you your daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. You can follow me on Twitter at CoxSports1. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On Bears. You can like Locked On Bears on Facebook. Join the Locked On Bears Facebook group for even more Bears talk. And make sure you hit that subscribe button on the Locked On Bears YouTube channel, to keep up with all of our video podcasts as well. Thanks for making the Locked on Bears podcast your first listen today. On the show today, we recap a big Bears win. We'll go through how they turned it around in the second half and how this team identity was really established in the process. We'll go through some of the big plays from Justin Fields, the good and the one bad interception, but how specifically I think Justin Fields learned from within the game from the interception in the first half to correcting it and attacking the 49ers differently in the second half. We'll go through some of the standouts, some of the guys that stepped up and played better than we would have even expected. Guys like Dominique Robinson and some of the other young defensive players, a couple of the wide receivers making plays on those big plays downfield and much more. And we'll kind of look at where this Bears team goes from here and what we should be keeping an eye on in the week leading up to the preparation for the Green Bay Packers, the 0-1 winless Green Bay Packers, the last place. Green Bay Packers hosting the first place Chicago Bears next week. But we got to talk about this game long before we get into next week's game. What a what a game it was, right? It was kind of ugly for a while there and it felt not great and you know it was it there were times in the first half right where it felt like same old Bears. But I think this team proved to us in the second half that they're not same old Bears doesn't mean they're going to be a playoff team or a Super Bowl contender or that Matt Eberflus is some genius coach necessarily, but like they proved that it's not going to be the Matt Nagy Bears because you saw the resilience and really a lot of of the things Matt Eberflus has been preaching that you you always kind of wonder. It's like, yeah, it sounds great and it sounds like coach speak, but every team says we're going to play tough and we're going to play hard and all et cetera, et cetera. But what you saw specifically in this game was because – the elements and the conditions were so bad. And as a result, the field was not great. I mean, there were so many just like natural things stacked against both of these two teams, but you saw how the two teams were affected by it over the course of the game. You know, the 49ers kept dropping off more and more. You know, they started out and then start fast, but right in the first half, they were kind of in control and then they slowly sort of declined as the the game wore on as the bears tried to wear them down as the elements kept getting worse. The rain kept getting worse and the mistakes started piling up the 49ers, you know, they they sort of, they fell apart a bit and the bears stayed firm, played hard, had good energy coming out of halftime. Like it was almost like it was zero, zero. They came out ready to keep churning forward, stick to their guns, stick to their game plan and keep pushing through and have that hustle, have that intensity get a couple of turnovers in there and as well, just playing smart, not having a lot of penalties. And it just felt like the Bears showed what they had been building on for so long during OTAs, training camp, preseason up to this point that they can outlast other teams. And maybe that makes them more of a second half team this season. And maybe it means that they're not always going to start the fastest because they don't have as much talent as some of these other teams. But when these other teams start getting tired in the second half. When their players start getting worn down, maybe from the weather, maybe from having the Bears run the ball on them for so long, even when the running game wasn't getting a ton of yards, more so with Montgomery than Khalil Herbert, that's a theme we'll have to get through later on in the week here. Eventually they wear down and the Bears do not. 
The Bears did not, and they're built to be a team that does not. They wear you down. You do not wear them down, and that they can hold that late-game advantage of being the more disciplined, calloused, tough, you know, Matt Eberflus kept talking about mental and physical stamina, and I think those two, having both of those things and being explicit about separating those things as distinct really shows up in what this Bears team did against the 49ers. And that's that's this new identity that really took hold. That that's, that new identity itself isn't going to be enough to win all the games for you, right? You're, you're, there's going to be losses, and there are going to be games that they're just, they don't play well enough or whatever, but like clearly they outlasted the 49ers in what was going to be a, a slow, wet, back-and-forth, defensive, physical type of game. And that's the type of team that the Bears have now with Matt Eberflus and with this organization coming together. Because that's what it came down to, right? It was, like, yes, the Bears had to make the plays, but a lot of what happened here was double-digit penalties by the 49ers kept getting in their own way. Of course, a couple of turnovers from Trey Lance that the Bears forced, right? Peanut punch from Jalen Johnson amazing play. I mean, you could just watch it over and over again. And then Eddie Jackson getting in there with his first interception in a long time, but being able to play loose and free and aggressive and downhill and get Trey Lance to make those types of mistakes, you know, they, and then defensively, you know, when the bears are attacking the 49ers, a coverage bust with Dante Pettis is left wide open. I mean, and, and Equinemius St. Brown gets behind the defense and Byron Pringle gets behind the defense, right? It's like the 49ers slowly crumbled and the bears kept sticking with it even as it wasn't immediately working, they didn't panic. They didn't throw everything out the window or abandon their preparation or what they came to do. There was a picture on Twitter that somebody somebody grabbed a screenshot during the game. There was a close up of Matt Eberflus holding his little piece of paper by his headset, and first it said like first quarter run the ball or something in, in all caps, and like that was what they wanted to do, and it worked. And I think the team feels that that idea of like we're gonna do this. And you're, we're going to stick with it even when it's not working and it's still going to work. Now the players are going to have that trust, right? There's no, there's no doubt that it can still work and can still finish games, right? If they end up losing that one to the 49ers or they get shut out, you know, they might, you might second guess and say, well, why did we keep sticking to that? It wasn't working and it never started to work. And that felt like that happened a lot under Matt Nagy. But like even Bruce and the Bears, yes, they made adjustments. They didn't just do the same thing over and over again, but like they stuck to wearing the opponent down and did wear the opponent down and got them to make those mistakes. And that's ultimately how your Chicago Bears win this game and establish the, the identity. It's a little bit bigger picture there. And I think there were some key, not only key players who stepped up and played even better than we thought they would, but some key moments in this game that I want to dive into a little bit more that can give us a, a more rich understanding of what shaped this Bears comeback victory next on Locked on Bears. Have you ever seen one of those viral videos where someone is staging a proposal and they get down on one knee? I think there was just one of these the other day where uh, that he drops the ring, right? And if they're on a they're on a, a dock and it falls through the cracks into the water and the proposal is ruined. You don't want to be that guy and you certainly don't want that splattered all over the internet when it does happen. But our friends at Brightco are here to sponsor to, to, to provide the to sponsor of the podcast and to provide jewelry insurance that makes sure you'll get a full replacement for the full value of that ring or any jewelry, no matter if it's lost, stolen, or you just can't figure out what happened to it. Brightco is here to protect your investment and make sure that your biggest and best moments, like like a proposal or whatever jewelry you've got, is protected insurance. So you can always have that option, especially if you. You spend a lot of money on that and you want it to go well and you certainly don't want anything to happen to it or you know, plenty of stories of stuff getting lost at a beach and you're looking with a metal detector, right? Brightco is here for all of that. It's the fastest, easiest, and cheapest way to cover your butt with the best jewelry insurance in the business. Go to bright.co forward slash locked on. That's B-R-I-T-E dot C-O slash locked on. This Bears game had plenty of ugly and no one's going to come out and tell you it was a great offensive performance. I don't, I don't think it was a great defensive performance, but certainly a better defensive performance than offensive performance. I mean, you hold the team to 10 points. It Defense did everything you would want it to do. 100%. It was a tough elements situation for either offense to have 
a lot of success. And we'll get into that a little bit in a moment here. And that's an important thing when it comes to this Bears game is like anything, anybody you want to say about one team being affected by the elements, just remember that the other team was affected by the same elements. So if one team struggled with with one thing and you say, oh, well, the Bears couldn't run the ball because of the elements, because it was because of the rain or whatever, you have to look at the other team and were they able to do that same thing better in the elements than maybe the elements aren't fully to blame. That's that's one of the running themes of this game that has stood out to me. But like the Bears did what they needed to do to get the job done. I don't think it's smart to look at Justin Fields' performance and try and necessarily project this into further games because both quarterbacks struggled with the wetness, the the the, the rain is affecting the path of the ball. Field said after the game, as far as like gripping it, he, he wore gloves. I don't know if you noticed. He's not always a, a glove quarterback wearer, but he wore them for most of the game. And he said it was just inconsistent how well he was gripping the ball. You know, so some some throws he feels he felt like he had a great grip on it and he could get it right where he wanted to. And there were other throws when he legitimately felt like his grip was not strong on that ball just because of the, the wetness at the time and how wet the, the grass itself was when it hits the grass too, in addition to, you know, the rain actually coming down on the ball. And so I don't think I, I'm trying to make sure that we don't try and take too much good or bad fully from this Justin Fields performance, because I, I think it's largely a set of, you know, physical circumstances that we won't see m- much like that for the rest of the season. But I do think a couple of things stood out with, with Fields and his performance. One, the interception in the first half, right? Looked bad, was bad. I mean, there's no, and even he admits after the game, like, yeah, that was a, that was a mistake and, and I, I shouldn't have put the ball there. But the way he talked about it was very revelatory to me. And I think it illustrated how even through the game, during the game, he learned from that moment. And I think that interception in the first half helped set up at least the first Dante Pettis touchdown, and I think some of the other big plays downfield passing as well. So Field said on that interception, he he said he, he knew the 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 San Francisco 49ers defense is what he called a vision and break defense. What he means by that is that the defense is reading the quarterback's vision, and when they when they think the quarterback has has sort of decided on where he the direction he's going to go with the ball, they'll break towards that side to try and you know be where the quarterback is going to go with it. And so he said on that interception, he was trying to move the linebacker, Fred Warner, away from where, I think it was Darnell Mooney he was throwing at. Mooney was going to Fields' left. So Fields was looking to the right to try and make the linebacker follow Fields' eyes more to the right. The problem was, because Fields was directing the linebacker to the right, he was then directing the entire defense to the right. And that included the backside safety who ended up picking off the pass. Fields was trying to get Warner to go to the right, but didn't realize that he was also then the safety who was too far left. His eyes going right brought the safety right, which brought him more into the play of where Fields wanted to throw it. Like he didn't have a way to make the linebacker go right and the safety go left at the same time because they're all going to follow his eyes. And he, he sort of realized that after the fact and as he was going through it. And I think that's what helped shape then why he found Dante Pettis wide open in the second half. Because he remembered, you know, first half, okay, my eyes brought the whole defense that way. This is how the defense is is reacting to what I do with my eyes. And I kind of forgot that it would bring the safety over too and led to that interception. So when he gets to that Pettis play, you know, pocket breaks down, he rolls out to his left. He's looking only left. It's the left half of the field. Those are where the receivers are. So the entire 49ers defense goes to the left. And then Fields in that moment, right, remembers or realizes or knew going in that because he's been looking left this whole time, the whole defense would be going left. And so if he looks to his right, there's not going to be any defense left because he's been at the left the whole time. So as soon as he glances back to the right side, Dante Pettis is there wide open. And I think that's a part part of that learning process as you went through the game of him realizing from the earlier mistake that, that Pettis would be open free on the backside because he had been looking left the whole time. To have that awareness of what he's doing and how the defense is responding to what he's doing and how he can then counter that by instantly flipping back to the right side and throwing back to the right side, where, of course, Pettis was then wide open. You saw it a little bit on this, the equanimous St. Brown touchdown as well, where he kind of kept the, the defense underneath with his eyes 
so that Equinemius St. Brown could kind of go behind them. You know, it's a little bit more of a miscommunication there than anything else. But like, and, and but on the Byron Pringle one too, right? Fields is, is not looking to Pringle's side, but he sees Pringle release free, but he can look middle of the field and then know it's going to be there and then fire that way, knowing that they're still reading his eyes and not just purely where the receiver is going. I don't mean to say that those were like brilliant, difficult throws, but Fields had to do so much to get to the throws. And that's what matters, right? Those were not like... Those were a pass that any NFL quarterback from where he stood could get the ball to where he threw the ball to. But not. But it takes a special quarterback like Justin Fields to do like on the Pettis play, right, to escape the pocket and avoid the sacks and get free and keep his eyes downfield and direct the defense and then know where his receiver is going to go. Everything before the pass on that Pettis play was special from Justin Fields. And it's those types of flashes combined with the live in-game learning from the interception that can leave you still feeling really good about what we saw from Justin Fields, despite it being eight for 17 for 121 yards, two touchdowns and an interception, like 85 pass rating is not terrible. It's just not a, a highly, highly over the top productive offensive performance. But that's why I'm trying to say like, let's not read too much into this type of a passing game because neither team had much luck passing the ball because it was just difficult environment to do so. Right. I'm trying not to read too much in David Montgomery getting your leading three catches and that each wide receiver only got one catch because there were only eight balls to go around. Like it just wasn't wasn't an environment conducive to that. But I think it was it was a good step for Justin Fields. Now, you what you want to do is not have to rely on Justin Fields to do all of the pre-throw heroics in order to get downfield passing games going, right? Like you want to make it easier on your quarterback. And I don't think that you can rely on fields doing that absolutely every week to that extent of, of really just offensive line can't hold up. So almost every play he's rolling out of the pocket and extending things with his legs and beating the 49ers largely with his legs. It works. It works when you need it to, but you don't want to have to need it all the time. And that's something we'll definitely keep an eye on here moving forward. But I want to get to some of the other real standout players, not named Justin Fields and kind of take a look at where this bears team is heading into next week against the green Bay Packers next on Locked on Bears. This episode of Locked on Bears is brought to you by our friends at Prize Picks, the better way to do daily fantasy football. Prize Picks is a little different than what your regular daily fantasy might look like. You're not competing against other people. It's you against the house. You pick two to five players and you decide if they'll score more or less than their prize picks projection. And you can win up to 10 times back on your money on any entry. Like I know one of the projections was total touchdowns for Justin Fields, 1.5. And I mentioned on this very podcast, it looked like a pretty strong over on 1.5 touchdowns by Justin Fields. Two touchdowns for Justin Fields cashes in, right? You'd pick, you put that with any other of the prize picks projections and you would have been winning money right there. But prize picks is not only just for foot pro football games, but college football, college basketball, professional basketball, baseball, hockey, golf, Tennis, soccer, esports, you name it, Prize Picks is there for you. It's super easy. You can make your entries in 60 seconds or less. And when you're ready with, to withdraw, you get your money back fast and safe. Download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can get a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 when you use our promo code LOCKED ON at deposit. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. Deposit at 50, prize picks will give you 50. Just don't forget that promo code locked on at sign up when you go to prizepicks.com or download the prize picks app. The Bears showed a couple of, I think, prize draft picks in this one. How about Dominique Robinson leading the team with 1.5 sacks, getting to the quarterback two times there, splitting one of them with, I think, Roquan Smith when it was all said and done, but not. I think far exceeding our expectations for Dominic Robinson, right? He was drafted as a raw defensive end who was just playing wide receiver a couple of years ago, still learning the position. We thought he'd get like some opportunities rotating in, right? He, he was going to play a little bit and maybe you see a flash here or there, but like, man, he looked not only like strong and athletic, but all, or I mean, <laughs> Freudian slip, not only did he look like fast and athletic, but he looked strong too, that that's that first sack of Trey Lance, like he just reached out with one arm and pulled a grown man to the ground. I mean, I know 
Trey Lance isn't the biggest quarterback in the world, but still, like he just one arm pulled a grown man down to the ground for a sack. I mean, it was just really impressive. It reminded me like his his whole aesthetic. You know, not not exactly his skill set is the same, and he's not built exactly the same. But when you just like watch the way he played in that game, it reminded me a little bit of like a rookie year Leonard Floyd, where not that Dominic is quite as freaky, bendy, athletic, but just like he's he's going a hundred percent high motor from the snap to the whistle every single time. You know, like there's sometimes there are plays when a pass rusher, you know, you you try your move and then you you can't win on your move and then you end up almost like playing playing patty cake with the offensive lineman and you're kind of just dancing around with him but not not going anywhere. But like Dominique Robinson was relentless. You know, he doesn't have a repertoire of pass rush moves, right? He's still learning different ways and, and counters to beat offensive linemen. You know, a great move on Mike McGlinchey in there on that first sack to get through and just a nice, like, get your hands out of the way and go inside. You can get by with that, but eventually teams are going to pick up on that and, and he'll have to develop and grow with that. But, like, he just would not stop on pass rushing plays. He was always trying to do fight, claw, scratch to get wherever he can around an offensive lineman. And, and it felt like that was the kind of energy that Leonard Floyd showed as a rookie where he would just get those opportunity sacks because he just worked a little bit harder and pushed a little bit longer than other players. Like the second sack, you know, the, the half sack with Roquan Smith, that like Trey Lance is just stepping up into the pocket and Robinson just stopped. I mean, never, never stopped rushing, didn't give up and just Lance kind of stepped up and gave him leverage, but it was because he was still rolling and still trying to get as much as he could on that play is how he ended up getting half of a sack there. And he wasn't just content to kind of play patty cake and dance back and forth with the offensive lineman while the quarterback runs away. So like, I, I was very encouraged with the early flashes of what we saw from him. I think eventually there'll be a, a, a point where you might plateau once teams now have more tape on you and know your moves, but that takes a long time. And I think we're still going to see more of these bright flashes from Dominique Robinson in the very near future. Of course, you saw Jaquan Brisker deliver a couple of big hits, maybe some left to be desired in coverage from him and, and Kyler Gordon, but it, it happens with rookies, but you still feel like Brisker was that physical, that physicality, you know, getting the backfield on the goal line and making a tackle for a loss. Really liked a lot of what we saw from him. Certainly Braxton Jones had had some trouble with Nick Bosa as expected, but it wasn't a complete disaster. I'm looking forward to seeing the tape on this offensive line as a whole because I think the run blocking was worse than the pass blocking. And yeah, the 49ers have a very good defense, but it feels like that's, that's going to continue to be a problem until that group builds more of that cohesion. I don't like the rotating at right guard. I think you should pick a right guard and play that right guard. I know they're waiting for Lucas Patrick to maybe take back over at center when the cast comes off, but like then just leave him on the bench, let Tevin Jenkins work or, or leave Tevin Jenkins on the bench and leave Lucas Patrick at right guard. But like, I don't like rotating in, in the regular season when you can avoid it whatsoever, but like there's still time where we see offensive lines over the course of a season, if they can stick together and stay healthy and have the same lineup, get better as they get used to each other, especially a line like this that has right now three very young players and might might change, or four really young players, but Lucas Patrick might make it a little bit more veteran in there. But time for those guys to kind of gel together will we'll do this team a lot of good. I thought Equinemius St. Brown impressed me as a blocker in addition to his big touchdown catch. But on Dante Pettis's big touchdown, Equinemius will put a block on the cornerback that made that from, you know, a 45-yard catch and run to a 51 yard touchdown or however long it was like his last block there made it a touchdown and not just a first down. And there were a couple of plays in the running game too, where I thought other wide receivers struggled more with blocking, but in screens in the running game, Equinemius looked like a, a solid blocker out there. And I thought Armand Watts, the defensive tackle they just got from the Vikings had some really good pass rushes on the interior. Like he was never the guy who gets totally around his offensive lineman and gets a hit on the quarterback necessarily, but he would kept collapsing some of the top of the pocket so that Lance couldn't step up fully. Like it, it was like pressure, but not fully beating. You know, it's like, again, he's not getting around the offensive lineman, but he is putting the offensive lineman close enough to the quarterback to disrupt the quarterback's comfort at times in the pocket. And I thought not that it was like, you know, all-star performance, but they were getting more of an interior pass rush than I might've guessed based on the pedigree of their guys. And I thought Watts was a guy that again, had a lot of that motor, that you like to see from that position. I, I think there's there's a lot to build on from this game. It certainly hasn't stopped the Packers from being, I think, nine and a half point favorites opening with our friends at Bet Online. Not to, to be expected, despite the Packers losing that game, it's going to be a very motivated Green Bay team. Certainly going to be watching 
what they decide to do with this back and forth right guard rotation, or if Lucas Patrick is ready to go back to center against his former team. I'm curious to see how the game plan and the play calling is or isn't different from Luke Getze. Cause first half, especially right. Felt conservative running ball on third and long draw play screens on third and long. A couple of those drives just kind of being seeming like content to punt. How much of that was the weather and feeling like field isn't gripping the ball well, and it's raining and, and you want to stick with the running game and how much of that is just what we're going to see week in and week out. So that'll be interesting things to kind of keep going forward, but it just feels like this was a real establishment for the bears team. Not, not them showing that they're some super talented, great team. I mean, the box score looks bad, but it showed you the type of team they were and the identity of a team that like win, lose or draw, they're going to make the green Bay Packers have to work for it. And they're going to push this green Bay Packers team in the second half. If they're showing any signs of getting tired or breaking down or falling apart, this is a bears team that will make you play all four quarters and are never going to just pack it in. I think that's the message they sent to the NFL that it might look ugly. The box score might not look pretty, but we might still win as they did in this case. And even if they're not going to win, they're still going to really test you and make you work hard for your victory. And that's, what's going to make this team exciting to watch fun to watch. And it's going to be, it's just great to see these young players ascending and showing you what they can do. And we get to learn so much about this team as the season goes on. We'll definitely learn a lot more about this team. Once we go through the all 22 film, we'll break that down for you here on the podcast, either tomorrow or the next day, depending on how quickly the film comes out, hoping tomorrow's podcast. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. So you're keeping up with all of our daily in-depth Chicago bears news and analysis, whether it's on Apple podcasts, Spotify, or if you're watching along on the YouTube channel, that subscribe button is going to be the best way to keep up with everything we're doing and making sure you are not missing episodes. We really appreciate it. When you make locked on bears, your first listen each and every day, it really is, in my opinion, the best way to celebrate a victory Monday today and every day, the best way to bear down.